Hello everybody and welcome to 10 Minute Nodes, a guide to the visual scripting tool for space engineers. Today, we'll be talking about some of the windows in the visual scripting tool, as well as some of the nodes that you can use. Alright, so let's start off by taking a look at some of the windows you see when you're using your visual scripting tool. First, open your visual scripting tool. Once in here, you'll see four screens. It's okay if they aren't in the same layout that mine are here. I've modified my layout just a slight bit. In the front here, you can see the localization tool. This is used for making predetermined messages that your script can reference and then display in-game. However, currently if you're using it for anything other than a campaign, it appears to be broken. Over on the right here, we have the Scripts Explorer. This will show a list of all loaded scripts in the game or in the editor. As you can see right now, we have none loaded, so it's empty. Below that is the Events tab. That allows you to place certain key events and events nodes. We'll cover that later in this video. And underneath that is a log. This will display any errors that occur or any modifications that occur, such as adding in nodes or what node you're clicking on. Let's talk about how to move some of these windows around. So if we click and drag on the Scripts Explorer, or sorry, click, sorry, click the little arrow, and you can see that we have a couple options here. We have Hide, Auto Hide, Tab Document, Dockable, and Floating. So if we turn this to Floating, you'll notice that it is now a floating window. And when I click and drag it, you can see that a lot of arrows come up on screen. And so if we hover over the center thing that looks like a folder, we'll notice that it'll blow it up and put it as a tab on the main screen. However, for easiness sake, let's not have that. If it's as a tab, click and drag, and it'll again put it into a floating window. Now, if we hover over here, we can see that we can tell it to put it on top, to the right, to the left, below, or on the same window. Let's put it back up top. Now, keep in mind, this is true for any of these four windows. We can do it with a localization tool as well. You notice here, turns it into a little tab. And we can put it on the right if we wanted to. However, for easiness of seeing your scripts and also for seeing your localizations, I would recommend having it be a tab. Keep in mind, once you move these, whenever you then load up the editor, it'll make sure that they're in the same spot every time. Now, if we take a quick look at this file section up here and the graph section up here. Over here in the file section, you have the option of creating a new script. And if we click on it really quick, we can see that we can create a script, level script, script, uh, state machine script, script state machine, or a campaign. Let's close that really quick. Also up here, you see the option of being able to open. And if I open, it'll take you to the last folder that you interacted with that has scripts. As you can see here, I have my main TDM script here, along with some other scripts that the TDM level script references. Let's cancel that. Then up here you have save, save as, save all, and attach. The save and save as are self-explanatory. The save all will save every single script or script reference that is open in a tab. Attach is what you can do if you need to attach your level script to a world. We'll cover that in a later video. And that covers all you need to know about the windows in the visual scripting tool. Next, we'll move on to the events tab and some of the nodes inside of there along with some other nodes that you can place in inside of the visual scripting tool. All right, so let's take a quick look at how a typical node actually looks inside the visual scripting tool. Here we have an add notification tool. I've picked this because it it does a very good job of showing what a typical node might look like. So, as you can see, there's all of these little circles on either side of this node. So those are input and output points. Anything on the left side of a node is an input. And typically, anything at the top of a node is a sequence input. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. So as you can see here, this has string message. So that first thing here, that string, that tells you what type of variable this accepts and what type of variable it is looking for. As you can see under here, string font equals white. That has a default value. And if we click on this box, you can actually see it brings up an edit text and you can change that. So if we wanted to make it red, you can do red. Or if you wanted to make it blue, you can do blue or green or any of the normal text colors that the game supports. I don't have a list of it right in front of me. 
And then for string message, you can double click and say, hello world. If I can type correctly, we could say that. And then it would put that out. <laughs> and then you have long player ID. So it's looking for a long integer. And if nothing is put into any of these inputs, this is what it'll use for the pieces in it. However, if something is put, it'll overwrite any of these. Now, we also want to talk about sequence. And like I said, there's a sequence input node, or this, it's a sequence node up at the top, or a sequence input here, and a sequence output here. So what does that mean? Well, you have two types of nodes, and we'll go over here really quickly, and I'll explain to you. So you have sequence-dependent nodes and sequence-independent nodes. Now, according to Keen's visual scripting guide, and this kind of makes sense, a sequence-dependent node is any node that can change a state or value. And then sequence-independent nodes can only output a value. So here, this branching node is a sequence-dependent node because depending on what this input here is, it can output one of two possible states, true or false. Versus here on this arithmetic, arithmetic, it can only ever output a value. So really quickly here, just to show, I'm just going to put a branching here just to show something. If something is connected and is part of the sequence, when you connect it, it'll give you this white line here. If something is a value, and it's connected to a value input, it will be a black line, as you see here. That's just so it's a little bit easier to tell where your sequence logic is running through versus where all your connections to inputs are. And that's really all you have to know about nodes. Um, another thing I want to stress is that even if a node allows you to connect an input to it, and maybe let's say you accidentally put a string to an integer input, just because it connects doesn't mean it'll work. If it's not the value it was looking for, or if it's an incorrect value, it may cause your script to not work or not even load correctly. Um, an example is like, if we really quickly pull up a add notification here, and you have a string here, and let's say you accidentally put in an integer. Well, that notification is no longer going to work. So that will break, if you have this add notification, that'll break this certain node. Also, I really quickly want to talk about event and key event nodes, which if your scripting tool setup similar to mine, you can see we have a little events node box over here on the right. And so what these are, as defined by Keen's uh, guide, is that an event node represents an event call from the game engine. So this is something that is happening in game. So every event has a set of parameters of some type that can be used as part of its sequence. In the case of what they're showing here is a script trigger entered. So you can see trigger name. Now this is an older node. So what it does not show is that if you actually put that on here, it also in outputs the integer 64 long player ID of the person who entered the trigger. Now also there's the key event node, which represents the same event call as a normal event node, but some of the arguments are considered as keys instead, or values that determine what object we're working with. So in this case, what we can say is, if we go back over here and we go to scroll down to the key events and do the exact same thing, you can see now we have the space, and let's call it uh, trigger A. So what we'll do is once trigger A is entered, It'll be like, hey, trigger A was entered, and it'll start off the sequence that's connected to it, and it'll also give the player ID. Versus with this normal event node, anytime any trigger area is entered, it'll say, hey, a trigger was entered, and it'll output the trigger name and the player ID. And that concludes this tutorial video. I would highly recommend checking out the visual scripting guide by Keen that's on Steam right now. If you don't want to read it, that's okay because my tutorial series will cover everything in there plus a little bit more. Next time we'll be taking a look at some more nodes. But that's all for now. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next video.